The following is a class given by His Holiness Jaya Bhattaka Swami Maharaj on November 5th, 1980. The class begins with a reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 13, Text 21. Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishta Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Shami Nukhinamane Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvise Sasanavadi Paschatya Deshitarine Namo Mahamadana Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Namane Gauravise Namo Namo E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Nandu Jagapote Gope Sagopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastute Tata Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brinda Vareswari Vrishaba Masuda Devi Pramanami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpadurubhyascha Kripa Sindhuvai Vacha Patita Nam Bhavanega Vaishnaveda Namo Namo Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabho Nityananda Jayadvai Tegradhara Sri Vasari Gauru Vakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudeva. 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 Your father, brother, well-wishers, and sons are all dead and you have passed away. You yourself have expended the major portion of your life. Your body is now overtaken by invalidity, and you are living in the home of another, purport. The king is reminded of his precarious condition, influenced by cruel time, and by his past experience he should have been more intelligent to see what was going to happen in his own life. His father, Vichitra Virja, died long ago, when he and his younger brothers were all little children, and it was due to the care and kindness of Bhishma Deva that they were properly brought up. <clears throat> then again his brother Pandu died also. Then in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, his 100 sons and his grandsons all died, along with all other well-wishers like Bhishma Deva, Drana, Chajjo, Karna, and many other kings and friends. So he had lost all men and money, and now he was living at the mercy of his nephew, whom he had put into troubles of various types. And despite all these reverses, he thought he had, would prolong his life more and more. Vidura wanted to point out to Dhritarashtra that everyone must, has to protect himself by his action and the grace of the Lord. One has to execute his duty faithfully, depending for the result on the supreme authority. No friend, no children, no father, no brother, no state. And no one else can protect a person who is not protected by the Supreme Lord. One should therefore seek the protection of the Supreme Lord, for the human form of life is meant for seeking that protection. 
He has warned of his precarious conditions more and more by the following words. Thus end the purport by Srila Prabhupada. So Bidura, the half-brother of Drona of Dhritarashtra, he is speaking to Dhritarashtra without pulling any punches, without holding back the truth. This is necessary for one to preach. Even if the hearer doesn't like what he is hearing, the preacher has to tell that which is really going to help him. Otherwise, what is the use? Uh, today we are plagued in an era when there are countless so-called preachers, but not one of them is saying anything which can elevate one's consciousness. Therefore, Sri the Prabhupada, he has brought the message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu all over the world so that real preaching, which will go to the heart, can transform the consciousness of the people. Here we see Dijarastra has schemed and he has killed only his own relatives by his scheming. Although he tried to kill the good nephews who were devoted to Krishna because they were faultless, the reaction instead came back upon him. But he is so heartless, he is so callous, that he is living at their expense. He's living in their house and they are maintaining him when he tried to kill them. So Bidur is not telling this simply to criticize. He's telling this to get him off his seat, to get him to leave and go in the forest, to take up the path of renunciation, to get him to become advanced spiritually. Yesterday we were visiting the Museum of Science, and as we were driving back from the museum, there we saw inside the museum so many Uprakarmas. They had achieved so many so-called wonders of levers and electricity and mechanics. But as we were driving away, we saw we had to stop at the light. And although the light had turned, we could go, but one old man was hunched over. And he was walking very slowly across the road. So we had to wait for him to pass. They did not have any scientific cure for old age. That would have been the real exhibit. How to cure old age. Prabhupada said these old people who are bent over, uh, that is due to too much sex. Someone who is too promiscuous in old age, his back goes out and he cannot stand straight. Sometimes you see them absolutely 90 degree angle. You see, simply disgrace. So, Dhritarashtra, he is in old age. And like everyone in old age, they don't really think about it as much as they should. But now is the last moment. Now is the last chance when I can fix myself in spiritual life. Instead, what do they think about? How is my son? How is my granddaughter? How is the great-granddaughter? How to get the grandson married? how to get the granddaughter married, and this and so on. Even to the last moment, what are they thinking about? They're simply thinking how to arrange the different uh, family arrangements, the different sex arrangements for the family. This is Griha Medi. So Bidur is trying to get Dhritarashtra off this platform. Instead, he's saying, why are you sitting here? He has to get him angry. So he'll do something. Why are you sitting here at the mercy of your grand? nephews, of your nephews, when they're the very enemies that you tried to kill and who killed all of your own sons. 
Then later he gives him the spiritual knowledge. Now you're in old age, you get out. You focus your mind in meditation. Die honorably not like an old dog sitting at the mercy of uh, enemies. So this also proves to us that according to time and place, you may say, well, this argument is not completely spiritual. Yes, it's getting his sentiment up. Because in the absolute platform, who is the enemy? Who is the friend? We have no enemies if we understand Krishna. Is our eternal friend, everyone is Krishna's part and parcel. Where is the enemy? Who can hurt us? But Dhritarashtra is not on that platform. He's trying to uh, kill Krishna. He's trying to kill Krishna's devotees. Still the door is trying to give him mercy. You see, that is the liberalness of a pure devotee. That even one is completely inimical. If he gets a chance, if he gets an opportunity, he'll also try to deliver. So this preaching is just according to time, place, and circumstance. Kal Desh Bhaktya. Because Dhritarashtra is materially attached, so he's getting his attachment, he's getting his sentiment up. Why you are wasting your time here? You are a disgrace. Any way you can get him out of his attached condition. The people like to think that they're very well protected. But today is a good time for people to realize uh, that there's no protection. No friend, no father, no brother, no sister, no mother, no nation can protect one from the cruel hand of old age and death. Whether it's by Russian missiles or whether it's by uh, accident on the highway. Padam, padam, yadi padam, matesham. There's danger in every step. Samasita je padapallava plavam mahat padam punya yaso marare vasa padam padam vasa padam bhavam budir vasa padam 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 yadi padam matesham that someone who is actually spiritually advanced, he doesn't take shelter in this material world. He doesn't take shelter in his material arrangements. Dita Rasta, he was feeling very safe in his material arrangements. He had his nephews. He had a nice room. So he wasn't worried. But the door is saying the same thing. Get up. You think you're safe? You're going to die at any moment. So everyone like this, they try to surround themselves. I have apartment, I have house, I have bank balance, I have nation, I have this, I have that. Are they safe? No. So, Srila Prabhupada, when he came, he wanted to give people this essence. And so he told people in very straight language, when he landed in Australia, they said, Srila Prabhupada, what do you think of our Western civilization? He said, I think you are leading a dog's life. You are leading a dog's life. Uh, and your United Nations means you are simply barking. The Srila Prabhupada, he was blunt when the people could take it. Because people have to see things in a different perspective. Uh, people drive by and they look at the devotees wearing their dhoti with a shaved head and they're thinking, what is that? They walk on the other side of the road or they, they look astonished. Because what is their standard? They're thinking that, oh, if it's suit and tie, that is civilization. And then now if it's a sports shirt, it's civilization. Last year it was a mini skirt, now it's another skirt. Whatever the fashion, that's civilized. So here in the Srimad Bhagavatam we find that uh, where is the nectar? Sri Krishna Chaitanya. Chaitanya means the living force. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Charitamrita means the nectar uh, of the pastimes of Lord Sri Chaitanya. And it means studying 
the nature of the living force. What is the nature of the living force that is to serve? Jira Sadupoi, Nitya Krishna Das. Our eternal nature is to serve. Serve who? Serve Krishna. This devotional service, a Krishna conscious movement, is meant to develop one's real service. In material life, everyone is serving. They're serving these people, their family, their nation, whom they are, protect, they are ex expecting protection from. But they don't get that protection at the ultimate moment. It's just like Karna. We hear how Karna, he was a great warrior, he was a Maharati. Karna could single-handedly fight with thousands and thousands of soldiers. Uh, but he was cursed. He was cursed that you can fight and have supreme ability, but when you need your power most, then you will fail. Then you will lose. That is the materialist. He is so great in his, uh, you see, in his battle. But when he really needs the shelter from all of his money, all of his power, all of his accumulations, he fails. And again, he's cast back down into repeated birth and death. It's not who makes the good show, but it's who ultimately wins the battle, you see. In Bengal, there's a class of people who argue that Ravana, Ravana is actually the winner of the Ramayana. Because Ravana, he was such a gallant warrior, he stole Ram's wife. He had so many soldiers, such a big palace, everything in Sri Lanka, every way. His whole life was uh, de simply defeated Ram. Only one time was he defeated by Ram at the end. They tried to take a point system and give Ravan technical victory. <laughs> but it's that one time at the end when that heart, when that arrow pierced his heart. That was the casting blow. Up to then, Ram was simply accommodating. And this way, Krishna accommodates the demons. But the swell blow at the end is the deciding factor. The devotee, he lives to spread the holy name around and living and dying, he lives in sound. It's the prayer of Bhakti Vinod you know, Thakur. So it's not how one gloriously lives, it's how one gloriously dies. If he dies crying, if he dies uh, evacuating, this is not glorious. And let you see, if one dies chanting Hare Krishna, leaves his body in full devotion, peaceful, that is glorious. That is human life. The people are not understanding. I think a, a person's greatness is how he's living. You see, now we're saying a person's greatness is not only how he's living, how he's dying. That is the ultimate test. That will show that actually how he lived. Anybody can bluff how great they are. But the ultimate issue that Krishna will see. <clears throat> so this Krishna conscious movement is to form people into the perfect life uh, and the perfect death, which means eternal life. <clears throat> and so to do that, you see, in material life, people don't like to talk about death. This is very uh, distasteful because they don't know what is death, simply giving up this rotten body and accepting your seat. A new body, even if they take rebirth, they're getting a new body. What is there to lament? And if they're actually Krishna conscious, then there's no more material body. They get a spiritual body. 
Krishna came down to manifest his past life. People can know what is, it, what is it to have a spiritual body? How we can internally be engaged in Krishna's service? But people forgot what it meant. They misinterpreted. So again Krishna came as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Simply to show how to worship Krishna. Krishna, in the Gita, gave his final instruction to surrender to him. And him means his spiritual body. He has his spiritual form. <clears throat> so that surrender is eternal. So Lord Chaitanya, he came and he showed how one surrenders. How did he show? He sent all of his followers. First he did big kirtan, hong kirtan, and he sent his followers out to preach, to induce people to take up the Krishna conscious movement. Lord Nityananda and Haridas Thakur, they were going door to door begging the people, please take to the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. His order is for you to chant Hare Krishna, Worship Krishna and learn the teachings of Lord Sri Krishna. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself is going from door to door begging the people to take up this message. Even He was abused. Even He was uh, beaten by Jagar Maharaj. No matter what condition, he continued to go on. Sometimes he was praised. Sometimes he was glorified. Uh, sometimes he was uh, neglected. But he had his order. <clears throat> Therefore, Lord Nityananda is described as the original spiritual master because he is taking the duty of spiritual master by going and preaching Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya requested everyone to be a preacher. He requested everyone to cooperate with preaching this Krishna conscious movement all over the world. Of course, when Lord Chaitanya appeared, he was in the mood of a devotee. You know that during Lord Chaitanya's presence, he wouldn't allow any murti of himself to be made. Of course, near the end of his pastimes, in Navadvi, uh, his dear friend, who was Subal in the Krishna Lila, Gauri Das Pandit, he couldn't bear the separation of Lord Chaitan. So he requested that you make an exception. And you allow a deity to be made of you that I can worship. So I can have someone to discuss Krishna Kathar. I cannot just be here alone. And you leave. Then I won't have any more friends to be with. So Lord Chaitanya said, how can I have a deity made of me? People will misinterpret. And he said, insisted that I won't let you go then. You must. One or the other. So then Lord Chaitanya agreed, they went back to Navadip, they were in Ambika Kalna, about 30 miles from Navadip, and they got a big neem tree and they brought it to Ambika Kalna, and there they <coughs> carved two beautiful deities, of one of Nityananda and one of Lord Chaitanya, full, full size, seven feet high. While Lord Chaitanya was there, they were making the, uh, the uh, carver was making exactly the, uh, as far as possible, the exact murti. And when they were completed, then Lord Chaitanya and Nityananda, they said, all right, now we're going. And Gauri Das Pandit, he said, no. <laughs> you stay. Let them go. <laughs> and he indicated to the deity. You stay. There's no difference, so you stay. <laughs> he thought that this time he had outsmarted Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> and so Lord Jesus said, all right, I agree. And he stood and he became 
just in the form of the deities, and the deities became movable and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> they go in and say, no, 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 you stay. <laughs> but then go. Then again, Lord Chaitanya he said, all right. He took again the form of deity, and then the other deities became Lord Chaitanya movable and started walking away. <laughs> no, 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 you stay. <laughs> Let the deities go. <laughs> so again, Lord Chaitanya did the same thing. And Gauri Das Pandit said, all right. There's no difference. <laughs> because he knew that, of course, all, so many other devotees, they also want to see Lord Chaitanya. And that, really, that was the first uh, deities of Lord Chaitanya to be established in this world, so far that I know. And uh, Lord Chaitanya, I was researching where Lord Nityananda was uh, married. And so I, in my research I was reading the, uh, <clears throat> in the scriptures uh, about that temple. And so they were claiming that Lord Nityananda was married there, which I didn't accept because the scripture did not say that he was married there. It said he was married somewhere else, Shaligram. When I went there, I we, uh, defeated them and they accepted that Lord Nityananda wasn't married there. It was something that they be heard passed down, but they had no scriptural evidence. So when I went to that temple, I was taking a darshan of these deities, very beautiful. And uh, after about two minutes, they closed the door. And I said, uh, why is this? And uh, they said, we are afraid that if he keeps the door open too long, Lord Chaitanya will run off. So we just, wait a second, it'll again open. But we don't leave it open more than two or three minutes at a time. So then I referred that why is this custom there? And in the scriptures, it mentions uh, that uh, these deities are very active. And there is well-founded reason for why they're opening and closing the doors. Because there was one time when the disciple of Goridas Pandit, Vidayaranda, he was arranging a big festival to celebrate the Vyas Puja of the spiritual master. When the spiritual master was out, and then when the Gauri Das Pandit came back, he saw that, what is this? And externally he became very angry because he didn't ask permission. He was a little bit uh, overextending himself. But inside he was satisfied that actually he had a proper devotional service attitude. But externally chastised with Ayananda, what are you doing? You have not taken any permission? There should be no festival. You cancel everything. So he died and he had no choice. He canceled, went, sat by the side again. He was chanting Japa, thinking how I can serve my spiritual master. But in the meantime, he had told so many people about the festival that all kind of uh, devotees were bringing carpets <coughs> of food, grain, fruits, dahi, chira, everything. And uh, as the carloads were coming, Gauri Das Pandit saw these people coming and then they're hearing there's no festival. He saw, all right. He called her then on the let there be a festival, since already they bought the things. So then he started a big kirtan. And uh, all the people who had come, all the devotees, hundreds and hundreds of devotees, they were all chanting very enthusiastically by the side of the Ganges kirtan. So Gauri Das Pandit had uh, gone inside of the ashram, and uh, he went into the temple and looked, and there he saw that Lord Chaitanya Yutinanda, they're gone! What is this? Where they have gone? He ran outside, looked, and there he saw that Rita Hidayananda, their Lord Chaitanya and Nityananda, they are dancing with the arms out there, jumping, and they're shouting, Hari Bol, and chanting. And he saw, and he was amazed. And then he became fearful that what if they just go on with the kirtan, they may completely go away, I won't have anyone. So he picked up his uh, coward stick. And he went out, remember, he's Subal, so he has this friendly mood. And he, he chased after uh, Lord Nityananda and Lord Chaitanya. He said, what are you doing leaving the temple? Next thing you run off. And he chased them back into the temple. Get in that temple and don't go away again. <laughs> <laughs> and when, uh, when Lord Chaitanya saw the Goy Das Padmit coming in that mood, he hid in the heart of Hidayananda. <laughs> so then... Uh, after that, Hridayananda became known and uh, famous. You'll see Chaitanya Charitamrita, Chudoi Chaitanya. 
Uh, one who has Chaitanya in his heart. So those deities uh, are still being worshipped. And uh, they, that's why they only, they just, they, yeah, if you take a darshan, they don't allow you to take a photograph. They have a custom. I would have liked to. Maybe by hook or by crook, but uh, <laughs> officially they won't allow and uh, they just give about a three-minute darshan and then close the door, wait for a few <coughs> seconds, and then open. Because they said they're afraid that if there's some devotee comes, the Lord gets too attractive, he may go off. So they're afraid. So Lord Chaitanya, his worship of his deity, of all deities, is not different from his personal worship. And actually the special mercy of Lord Chaitanya is that by his worship one gets immediately purified from all offenses. Someone who's very attached to sinful activity, he should chant a lot of Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasri Gaur Bhaktivinoda before he chants Hare Krishna. It's more important if one is very attached Sometimes people ask the Prabhupada, why we don't just chant Lord Chaitanya's name? He said, because we are following Lord Chaitanya, he chanted Hare Krishna, therefore we also chant Hare Krishna. We don't jump over. But we follow in the footsteps. So because he chanted Lord Chaitanya, all of the great Acharyas chanted, uh, I mean, he chanted Hare Krishna Mahamantra, all the great Acharyas chanted Hare Krishna Mahamantra, we also chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra. But before we chant Hare Krishna, we do Allah, we do an invitation for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. We chant his holy names to enable us to chant Hare Krishna without offenses, by his mercy. So, of course, Dhritarashtra, at that time, he had no Lord Chaitanya. So therefore, although he was a not more of a offender than the people today, uh, especially than me. But because he didn't have Lord Chaitanya, he couldn't engage in devotional service. We should understand how fortunate we are. That because Srila Prabhupada has brought us, because the Acharyas have brought us Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, therefore we are getting the opportunity of actually serving Krishna in spite of committing so many offenses. to Vaishnavas, to the Holy Name. That is his special mercy. That he forgives one of offenses. Even someone who personally hit Nityananda, Jagar Malhai, they became completely forgiven by Lord Chaitanya. But once they received this pardon, then they didn't commit any more of Rai. That is also important. Once one accepts the spiritual master, he should not commit any more offense. That will be very inconsiderate. And that will be very detrimental, both to the spiritual master and to the disciple. The Spiritual master is the ocean of mercy. He accepts on behalf of Krishna the responsibility to deliver the fallen conditioned soul back to home, back to God. That means that when the disciple commits any offenses, engages in sinful activity, the spiritual master has to suffer for that. The spiritual master being a transparent medium. Even if some offense that is sinful life is generally transmitted back to Krishna. But when he's negligent by initiating unqualified people and they commit sinful activities, so then Krishna gives him a token. Even his transparent medium, he gives him a token sickness, or some kind of misery. So you can understand that everything is not the way it should be. 
and is someone who is not a transparent medium, who is not simply being spiritual master on behalf of Krishna, but who is being spiritual master for some other motive, then in proportion to his lack of transparency, like a filter, the reactions are not going back to Krishna, but they're getting stuck up, they're getting jammed up. And that becomes a tremendous burden. So in the same way, a preacher who's going out, his duty, he may not be initiating people he needs, but any preacher, his duty is to repeat the message exactly as he's heard it. A preacher is also responsible. If he misdirects someone, if he gives an instruction which is not bona fide according to sadhu, shastra, and guru, He's responsible. If a person follows that instruction and following it gets himself further implicated in material life, then the reaction comes back on that preacher. The Shikha Guru, he doesn't take any permanent responsibility for uh, the people to whom he gives Shikha. His responsibility is to simply give the message of Krishna. There is one initiating guru and there is many shikha gurus. Anyone who purely repeats the message of Krishna, he's giving the shikha. And someone who is always purely giving the message of Krishna, then he's respected as a shikha guru. So every preacher, he's giving teachings of Krishna. So in that moment when he's preaching, he has to be careful that he's exactly repeating Krishna's message. Otherwise, if he gives a mis-message, a misdirection, he's responsible. Therefore, a preacher, he has to listen very carefully. Sravana Kirtana. To preach, you have to listen. Therefore, Sri Prabhupada said, to do some kirtan, my preachers should read. They should attend class and they should hear carefully. Because Vidura was a pure, transparent medium, he simply was able to give Dhritarashtra the message. Even he was a materialist, even he was engrossed, even he was the lowest person, envious even of his own nephews. By Vidura's transparency, he gave him the message which saved him from this material situation. So in the same way, every devotee has to strive for that transparency, strive for that pure devotional mood, simply by hearing and chanting and serving without any material motive, without distraction, without raja and tama, without passion and ignorance contaminating their consciousness. And the more that one becomes transparent, the more he'll be able to deliver the most fallen people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes? Everything we present is a catastrophe. You can tell someone the wrong way you want to some kind of age. So, do you have a message to do with this? Sometimes you run to Christian. Who are, you know, strictly Christian. And sometimes, you know, I just go around and get there, you know, tell them, just to get their hands on them, you know, I'm going to pray for them. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to pray for them. It's crazy. It's like, you know, it's about telling them this, and you have to suck it for them. I remember that Srila Prabhupada was on the morning walk. And there was some old lady in the West who came up to him and uh, requested, please give me some instruction, Father. And he said, have faith in God. That her <coughs> situation, if he would have said, uh, Obviously, he, Siddha Prabhupada saw that this was the teaching which was most appropriate and 
capable for that person to assimilate. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong uh, with uh, Jesus Christ. It's just that he's only taking one up to a certain level, and beyond that, he hasn't given his instructions. A devotee can give an instruction to a person which may not be the complete instruction, but he shouldn't give a completely misleading instruction, encouraging the person to do something which is completely detrimental. If the person is a fanatic Christian, and uh, you're encouraging him in his uh, religious fervor, it's not reducing him in his spirit, it's not taking him any further away from where he's going. But if someone isn't a fervent Krishna, and instead of getting him, and he's receptive to Krishna, instead of getting him fired up in Krishna consciousness, if you uh, then take him like back off on the left side and send him over to, to some uh, more karma kanda type of religious principles, then that's not doing him any favor. As far as I understand it, this record distribution basic principle is fund collecting, as far as the preaching potential. I think the education Maharaj just has a different program for the future. <laughs> so for fundraising, of course, sometimes it's a different situation. Yes. Also, it is at equally well known that the it is easier to take to evil than to the righteous path. With these two premises in mind, would your Divine Grace like to give me some clarification on what is the philosophy in Lord permitting demons and their demons? Living entities in this material world are fallen spirit souls who have forgotten the Lord's lotus feet. So he's giving them a chance in this material world to, number one, get back to him, and number two, to satisfy their material desires. So if some living entity doesn't want to serve Krishna, Krishna allows them to act. In fact, in the Bhagavad Gita, he says that for someone who acts in a demonic mood, that Krishna says, I satisfy him, and he, for countless births, he again and again and again takes birth in the families, in the wombs of the demons. So, Krishna, he tells everyone they should surrender to him. Just like a father tells his grown son that you should still stay with us and don't go off uh, alone. But if the son wants to go off and go to the brothels, the father, what can he do? He can't tie him down. So Krishna is treating the jivas as uh, adults. He's giving them a chance. You can do what you like, but you should do this. So some are good sons and some are bad sons. Some are devotees and some are demons. So naturally, if a, if a bad son starts to inflict pain on the good son, then the Lord has to step in, the Father has to save. Apart from that, the bad son is doing nonsense somewhere. He's watching when he'll come back, but he's not interfering. Until it creates too much of a disturbance, and then he makes an arrangement so that everything can be properly arranged so that people can all be good sons. They can all be engaged in devotional service. So in this way, it is considered that Krishna's liberalism to allow his jivas, his part and parcel living entity, to uh, become misdirected is less merciful than the pure devotee who goes even to those misdirected souls and requests them, why you have forgotten Krishna? You don't see how you are suffering. You come back to Krishna and be happy.
So Krishna, he doesn't have to come here to actually defeat the demons. What he does is he allows two demons to become very powerful. And then the demons in their power, they uh, fight against each other, and then they destroy each other, and then the devotees, they don't have any more trouble with the demons. Generally speaking, the demons are very envious, so especially they become envious of each other. They are also envious of the devotees, but the devotees are not so presumptuous. They are non-assuming. So they, they see the non-devotees are also very proud, so they are very conspicuous. So the demons, they fight against each other. That is also Krishna's mercy. When previous age Krishna would come down to kill the demons, in this age he's come down as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as Harinam, and to kill the demonic mentality of the people. And this way he kills the demon, not by uh, taking their life, but taking their demonic mentality and killing that, and turning them into devotees. So Krishna is giving a very easy way out for the demons. But how much can he do alone? He needs his devotees, you see. He's actually given opportunity for his devotees to go out and give Krishna. And this will change the demonic mentality of the fallen soul. You mentioned that because the devotees are not assuming, uh, they're not so presumptuous as demons, so they don't stand out as much. But sometimes it's seen that uh, even as devotees, we attract demons to uh, larger and lesser degrees. And is that, is that attraction that, that the demons are having for uh, such devotees uh, do it all to the consciousness of the devotees? Just like Prahlad Maharaj, he was simply preaching Krishna consciousness. But he attracted the envy of his own father. So when a devotee is actually completely humble, simply preaching without any uh, false ego, even then such demons are there, they'll want to persecute him. It is there in history. The demons and devotees, uh, they're always... Uh, having a clash. But when Krishna wants to kill the demons, he allows another demon to become powerful and they kill off each other. The thing is that if a devotee becomes contaminated with a demonic attitude and acts very uh, untactfully, getting a person agitated, and then thinks that I'm a devotee, I remember in, in Mayapur, there's a Guru Dev Nila, Sri Tamal Krishna had a wonderful leela. There was a bunch of rowdies. We were distributing prasad to about 4,000 people. And there were a bunch of rowdies. Actually, there was just so many people. It was during the festival. The whole place was packed with maybe 30,000 people all over the ground. And about 4,000 were sitting down in the field. We were giving them prasad. And uh, some rowdies came into the kitchen and tried to pollute the uh, prasadam and diff different things. So one of the cooks picked up a spoon and uh, he uh, discouraged the rowdies from entering further into the kitchen. And they went off. But there was one devotee who later on went to Nubandava and was uh, head of the Chatriya thing, who uh, at that point the people probably could have gone so they're pretty rowdy. He wasn't really wrong in what he did. I'm not saying this in a criticism for what he did, but just to illustrate a point. He picked up a bamboo about 20 feet long, starts swinging around his head. And uh, at this point, of course, it would look more like Kuruk Shetra, the Prashad distribution field. The people started just running in all directions in 1972 or three, something like that. And uh, he chased the people off the property. And they started throwing brick bats through our windows uh, from the road up to the, uh, the go-down. 
So this uh, devotee, at that point, he hid somewhere because they were they got reinforcements were out to get him for picking up the bamboo and swinging at him. So Srila Prabhupada heard about the difficulty and he told uh, Tama Krishna Guru, uh, Goswami that he should go and settle up the whole thing. So the Tama Krishna took about 20 devotees and they started chanting kirtan. And they went from the building up to the, to the land and they started to chant kirtan. They sat down at the, the, front, the road junction right at the uh, front gate. There was no gate at that time. It was just before there was any gate. And they just started to chant Hare Krishna. And some of the rowdies wanted to uh, uh, throw bricks on them or do something. And the people, the public stopped them and said, no, they're chanting, you can't do anything. And things are getting quiet. But then all of a sudden, that devotee who had picked up the bamboo, he walked in the, sitting in the kirtan party. And they said, there he is! <laughs> and they weren't accepting that suddenly he became, you know, like, uh, you know, a saint. They, they were remembering that this was the guy that just about smashed their head in with the bamboo and so they picked him up and they started to work him over. And it got pretty serious. He had to be dragged off and hidden somewhere. So the example I'm trying to give, of course, is that if you come on very heavy but then at the same time you want the, uh, the shelter from Krishna as a uh, devotee. Of course, actually, his heaviness wasn't bad. He just shouldn't have immediately gone to the kirtan party and tried to you know, expect that they're going to immediately have transcendental vision and see that actually he's... <laughs> but uh, actually Guru Dave was very brave. He was sitting there chanting and uh, took a lot of uh, nerve to do that in the middle of about 200 rioting people. Sometimes you see devotees, they act uh, inconsiderate of the person. Yet they feel I'm a devotee. He's this when a person reciprocates and does something back, then they become very indignant. So we should see that actually we are not uh, taking out our passion or our material uh, thing out onto the other person, and then keeping the uh, pride that I'm a devotee when he reciprocates. Even then, there'll be demons. It's a fact that if one is very considerate, he's simply preaching, who uh, will persecute a devotee. But uh, that's just another thing. That even happens to Prahlad Maharaj. That happens to all great devotees. But Krishna, he protects such devotees. And when a devotee doesn't get protected, when a devotee gets what it appears to be a lack of protection, generally speaking, it can be traced to the fact that he was insensitive to what was the actual etiquette at that moment. And then there's other instances you see that a devotee is preaching, some demon comes, and uh, he is protected. I remember so many Sankirtan stories, how a devotee was preaching and some demon comes up and just at this moment when it looks like he's trying to get his head smashed in, something happens. I remember that I told the story in the Rathyatra last year how this one demon came up, tried to incite a whole riot, and out of nowhere a bull came and <laughs> picked him right up off the ground, Dharma personified. <laughs> and I remember from Los Angeles, so many times in the West, demons would come and devotees would take care of them before the person that they are persecuting could uh, do anything, could be hurt. So, of course, the devotees also use self-defense. They use uh, whatever is necessary in Krishna's service. But the preacher, if he's actually just purely trying to spread Krishna consciousness, he gets protected. But if he gets a little into the modes and starts to overreact, loses cool, whatever you like to call it, then uh, the reaction may be more. And you can't blame that on Krishna. According to one's surrender, Krishna is going to give shelter. In that proportion. 